Mr. Senator, welcome to our studio in Prague of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. You're going after Prague to Kyiv with a visit to yes, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of your visit? What's on your uh, agenda? Going to Ukraine for a visit, a fact-finding visit, uh, will focus on two things primarily. Uh, one is to be sure that the United States is providing the kind of assistance to Ukraine that they need, uh, including military assistance, uh, to be able to defend their territorial integrity. Uh, as you know, the United States Congress uh, has over the last couple of years authorized the use of more military assets uh, by the U.S. government to be able to be sold to the Ukrainians. And uh, very recently, the new administration has authorized uh, the sale of certain equipment to be able to allow the Ukrainians to defend themselves. And I'm on the Foreign Relations Committee, have been involved in these efforts. I want to see uh, how it's working and, and what uh, the Ukrainian government is looking for from the United States. Uh, second, we'll be talking about the reforms, economic reforms, political reforms. I think uh, both are very important. One is the territorial integrity of a country that after the Maidan has uh, turned to the West and we should be there, as should the European Union and others, to support them. Uh, but second, we need to be sure that they are implementing their reforms. And there has been some progress made there. There's also been uh, areas for more progress. So we're going to be talking uh, to the uh, leadership as well as the uh, members of the RADA, the, the parliamentarians, about those issues as well. Mm -hmm. You will be also present at the delivery of uh, uh, America's first batch of weapons to Ukraine this year. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of this particular event? Mm -hmm. Well, it allows uh, the Ukrainians to be able to simply defend themselves. And one of the issues that has come up in the Congress is why hasn't the administration been more proactive in, in helping uh, Ukraine? In the Obama administration, there seemed to be an interest in it, but it was never effectuated. It was never, it never actually was delivered. Uh, now in this administration, uh, after uh, many months of discussion, now they're moving forward. And so, uh, again, I think it's the, the right thing for the United States uh, for others to do on behalf of Ukraine is to allow them to purchase weapons to be able to defend themselves, including uh, these new weapons that are being delivered now. Mm -hmm. uh, will Ukrainians be able to use these weapons uh, whenever they want, wherever they want, however they want, or there are some strings attached? It's primarily for defense purposes or what the situation looks like? Well, it's, it's primarily for defense purposes because they are not on the offensive. They are defending their integrity of their own territory. And so in the eastern border of Ukraine, there's been a need uh, to be able to respond to some of the Russian-backed insurgents. Of course, there have been uh, Russian uh, equipment that has been captured that is, uh, you can see it on the square in, in Kyiv, um, that is, you know, things that are difficult for them to defend against, tanks in particular. So uh, the Havilland missiles, which is part of this, is, uh, is a response to that, to give them the opportunity to be able to push back and to be able to defend themselves. Among these weapons are anti-tank javelin uh, uh, missiles. That's correct. Yeah, the, yeah. The, what the importance of this particular, because it's new uh, weapons for Ukraine. Well, this again, it's, it's, a, it's a weapon that allows them to be able to respond to the, the, the threat that they're facing, including from, from tanks, uh, which, you know, after World War II, um, uh, one would have thought that uh, this kind of activity would uh, no longer occur in Europe, uh, and yet uh, it happened. Uh, Crimea uh, was taken, and on the eastern border, um, you know, there has been a, a kinetic war, as we say. There's, there's, there's been a need for the Ukrainians to be able to have the basic weaponry to be able to, to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Senator, in some uh, uh, analytical circles in Washington, there is a, a, a school of thought saying that more weapons means uh, mean more tensions, more violence, so that they are, what, what, what's your response to that? Well, I, I think the uh, the proven theory is just the opposite, which is by having the ability to defend yourself, it's more likely that you will achieve peace, because then there's some consequences, there is some pushback. And I think the, the, the strength of the military has certainly improved, the training has improved, uh, the NATO countries uh, have been very helpful in that regard, including the United States, but also many other NATO partners. And now, uh, you know, there is uh, an opportunity for them to have additional weapons to simply be able to say there, there will be consequences, uh, you know, if the aggression continues. And I think that will lead to a more peaceful solution, uh, including uh, an agreement to live by the Minsk agreement uh, and Minsk II, rather than uh, what we have seen up to date, which is without being able to push back, without having consequences, there was, uh, there was more aggression and, and therefore more bloodshed. We want to see less. We want to see peace in the region. 
Um, the Ukrainians are not trying to be on the offensive. They're just trying to defend their, their own integrity. Mm -hmm. The way I reports, Mr. Senator, that uh, U.S. Uh, arms will not be delivered to right-wing Ukrainian uh, uh, volunteer battalions. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's true, uh, that there is some political uh, strings attached. Well, no, my understanding is it's going to the Ukrainian military, and the Ukrainian military will, you know, have the control of the weapons and be able to use them appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, are you optimistic about uh, chances that uh, sooner rather than later the conflict in the east in U of Ukraine will be resolved peacefully? Well, I think it, it will be resolved um, through a commitment, not just by the Ukrainian uh, army and, and their military uh, forces and the better weaponry that they're able to, to use, but by the rest of the world as well, particularly the European Union and the United States. And we need to stand by them uh, as we stand by them. and retain the sanctions that are appropriate, which are in response to the aggression and in response uh, to the illegal taking of Crimea, I do think things can be resolved, but not if uh, there is not that resolve and that commitment. So one of the things that I'm talking about as I uh, go through Europe is the fact that uh, whether I'm here in the Czech Republic or when I was in Germany uh, two days ago, is that we need to continue to stand tall together. Mm -hmm. And in that case, there's a much higher probability of success. I want to ask you about Crimea. Is Crimea uh, still high on American uh, uh, geopolitical radars? I mean, uh, uh, four years after annexation, four years after illegal occupation of Crimea, do uh, uh, Americans pay attention to Crimean problem as well? Yes. I mean, I, I think we, we do and we should, and so should uh, the EU and others. It should be something that, uh, you know, the entire world, including the United Nations, uh, continue to stand tall on because Again, this is really the first time, as I look at it, uh, since World War II, that we, we've had this, this, this kind of activity without a response. Um, so, you know, we need to continue to stand firm, and uh, by doing so, hopefully the uh, success will be uh, good in, in Crimea and in Ukraine, but also uh, we are not setting the precedent for other uh, aggression to take place around the world. Uh, Mr. Senator, my last question is, you follow Ukrainian events, you were a founder and co-chair of uh, uh, U.S.-Ukrainian caucus in the U.S. Senate. Do you have optimism about Ukrainian future, taking into account all difficulties and challenges, mm -hmm. challenges that Ukraine is facing now? Ukraine has always faced challenges. Um, you know, one thing I'll be doing is going to the Holy Domor uh, Memorial when I'm there and reflecting on some of the huge challenges the country has faced. And, uh, you know, the Ukrainian people are tough. Uh, they're resilient. And uh, I'm very hopeful. I mean, I think what happened in the Maidan, um, you know, was the, the revolution of dignity. And it was about the dignity of Ukraine being able to chart its own course and being an independent country and being able to make its own choices, the people of Ukraine stepping up. And I think ultimately that wins. Ultimately, it will prevail. As I mentioned earlier, there is a challenge with regard to the territorial integrity of the country and the ongoing military challenge. There are also challenges internally in terms of the continued reforms on the domestic side, uh, political reforms, economic reforms. Uh, I was there as an election observer during the presidential election, uh, as an example, uh, along with other parliamentarians from around the world. Uh, the rest of the free world is looking to Ukraine to be successful. And I have very high hopes that uh, with the continued commitment, the resolve of the EU, the United States, the United Nations, the free world, and with the resilience of the Ukrainian people, the future can be bright.